who will have much more to share with you here in a minute about what's happening at, at the FCC in Washington in general and uh, the future of the wireless industry. Uh, I also hasten to point out that, commission, that the commissioner was one of the most important supporters of PEAs, the partial economic areas, and was very instrumental in ensuring competitive carriers have meaningful opportunities to participate in the incentive auction. So thanks to her steadfast work, the commission established a spectrum cap of 20 megahertz uh, to prevent any, in, in the reserve, to pre prevent any one carrier from purchasing all the reserve spectrum uh, that in every market. So I, her support for uh, competitive policies uh, is uh, legendary. Also, she encouraged the FCC to be careful and carefully monitor the bidding activity during the 600 megahertz auction to avoid foreclosure uh, with the opportunity at her insistence to lower bid increase increments by uh, as much as 1% if needed. Uh, with her support, the final set of rules will make, much, make it much easier for the smallest carriers to bid in rural areas and potentially win and better serve their customers. Commissioner Clyburn um, has been a longtime champion of small competitive wireless carriers. I remind you again, while uh, she was acting chairwoman, uh, phenomenal accomplishments uh, in that uh, brief period of time. Um, she was uh, key in bringing about the interoperability in the 700 megahertz spectrum. And I'm pleased that the FCC has assured us that in the 600 megahertz spectrum auction, uh, we'll have interoperability. Uh, thanks to her continuing interest in this, I, I, uh, I know we'll uh, see that uh, uh, common theme throughout the, uh, the future of our, our, uh, our uh, auctions. Uh, we cannot thank her enough for ensuring those baseline considerations and uh, these guiding principles that she stood for uh, for years. So we thank you for that. And I also uh, uh, add that it's difficult to think of uh, a more engaging personality, a more impressive thought leader, uh, a more genuine person uh, that cares about uh, the well-being of the smaller carriers serving rural uh, regional America. And uh, with that, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I am so pleased to introduce the, the champion, a champion, the champion for competitive wireless carriers, uh, Commissioner Clyburn. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh-oh, uh let's try that again. Good morning, everyone. Now, I was the one out there dancing, so I don't know what your excuse is. So I was going to thank your president, Steve Berry, for his friendship and that warm introduction until he made that little comment about Methodists. Now I'm a Methodist, so I'm going to, I'll have a conversation with him later. But I want the rest of you to know that I am grateful uh, to CCA for allowing me to take part in this year's convention. As I said, I'll have a word with Steve in a few minutes. But like you, I am excited to witness the upcoming panel on women in wireless. We're seeing an increase of initiatives especially designed to reduce workforce gender gaps in the wireless in, in, industry and technology space. And that will be especially evident for all of us uh, in just a few minutes. What female leaders bring to the fore are levels of technical expertise, leadership, and ability that all of that inspire, it inspires, improves bottom lines, and closes persistent opportunities gaps. So I commend CCA for scheduling such a panel which will highlight all of these gains. Now I really enjoy attending this convention because it allows us to openly address key concerns and network with innovators and leading industry thinkers. And the fact that the licensed service areas of CCA's 100 plus carrier members covers more than 95% of this nation is not lost on this commissioner. And the voice of your members that voice is even more vital as the wireless industry evolves. In a relatively short period of time, we've seen our industry move from being a luxury to a must-have service. There is a generation out there that has only texted, talked, emailed, tweeted, shared, tweeted, shared pictures, watched videos, listened to music, tracked news, secured directions, or monitored their vital signs from a wireless device. And as you've heard me say often, 
As technology evolves to spur new business models, those four core principles of our nation's communications policy will always remain in style. Competition, public safety, consumer protection, and universal service. I start always with competition, not just because this is the competitive carrier's annual convention. Consumers benefit the most, I believe, when markets are competitive, and this most often leads to lower prices, more product options, and better service quality. For nearly five years, I've been calling on the FCC to consider creative and legally sustainable approaches to promote greater participation by all businesses in the communications industry. I have consistently pushed to ensure that the agency continues to implement competitive practices and frameworks. We can further these objectives by being enablers of investment and innovation when it comes to the deployment of commercial networks. By allocating Spectrum in 2014, the H Block and AWS3 auctions combined made 60 megahertz of paired spectrum available for commercial use, and the commission is on course to hold the first incentive auction of its kind in 2016. 600 megahertz spectrum will help carriers meet demand and increase competition for wireless service. But what makes me most proud about the AWS3 auction and incentive auctions is that the rules were designed to spur competition and participation from smaller carriers, particularly in rural America, and we receive the support to do so from a number of organizations, including you. You provided valuable insight on the competitive framework for the upcoming incentive auction. You work with industry stakeholders to develop a consensus so that we could shift from larger economic areas to smaller partial economic areas for the auction. Your efforts were responsible for our adoption of up to 30 megahertz of reserve spectrum in the incentive auction. It is important that our wireless auctions continue to attract carriers who may have a smaller service footprint and less capital than nationwide providers, but maintain a strong desire to acquire more spectrum to better serve these markets. I also appreciate your efforts to help staff provide much needed guidance on what communications are prohibited during the quiet period. I encourage you to carefully review that guidance and tell us if you need more information. Last week, the FCC announced that at the next open meeting, we will vote on an item to initiate a rulemaking proceeding on the licensing and technical rules for spectrum bands from 24 gigahertz and above. It was once thought not practical to deploy a mobile service network on spectrum bands above three gigahertz, but advances in engineering changed that way of thinking. Now, a number of communications companies have asked that we start this proceeding to help spur deployment of next generation, or 3G, of commercial mobile networks. 3G networks promise to offer higher data speeds with lower latency than current networks, and I believe we should ensure that our spectrum management policy with regard to allocations above 24 megahertz should promote competition as much as our spectrum policies below three gigahertz. I plan to carefully consider the NPRM with that goal in mind. Now, once the NPRM is released, I encourage you to participate and share your expertise so we can take a course in this proceeding that best promotes competition in the commercial wireless market. Another way the FCC is promoting robust competition and service to local areas in the upcoming auction is by reforming our competitive bidding rules to promote economic opportunity and competition, ensure accessibility, and avoid excessive concentration of licenses and disseminate those licenses among a wide variety of participants, including small businesses, as well as deterring unjust enrichment. In order to do all of this, we have attempted to promote a small, small business participation in the wireless industry, primarily by awarding auction bidding credits through the designated NRT program. The challenge here has been to find the proper balance between allowing small businesses to acquire spectrum through DE credits on the one hand and preventing par parties from 
circumventing the purpose of those rules and being unjustly enriched on the other. Between 2004 and 2006, our policy changes shifted this balance and it negatively impacted small business participation. However, about a year ago, parties, including members of CCA, told us that a number of rules, including the attributable material relationship rule and a former defaulter rule, were having an adverse effect on small businesses just at a time when these entities were facing increasing increased challenges to compete effectively in the commercial wireless industry space and serve targeted markets. CCA met with the FCC last year and provided valuable insight on the former defaulter rules potential to affect auction participation. And I am glad that we amended the former defaulter rule, the attributed to attributable material relationship rule and the policy that DEs must use licenses they win with DE credits to provide facilities-based retail service. I am thankful that your members work with the commission to push for these amendments and adopt a rule bidding credit for non-DEs with 250,000 or fewer subscribers. I hope that this credit creates incentives to deploy more networks and create jobs in these communities, many of which are economically challenged and overburdened. I also want to thank CCA and smaller wireless carriers for advocacy in the public safety proceeding to promote wireless location accuracy. The number of wireless-only American households has almost tripled in the past eight years and nearly 60% of those living below the poverty line live in wireless-only households. The number of wireless calls is drastically increasing, and one of my goals is to find ways to improve response times for 911 calls from cell phones. Calls to 911 from indoors is drastically increasing, and one of my goals is to find ways to improve response times for 911 calls from cell phones. I believe that in order to improve those response times, all carriers must do their part. But we must also recognize that smaller carriers face unique challenges. For example, handsets, handset change out rates impact smaller wireless carriers' ability to meet certain benchmarks. Therefore, with CCA's advocacy, we determined that non-nationwide carriers should be given more time, two more years to be exact, to meet these requirements. In the area of consumer protection, perhaps the most significant thing we ever undertook this year was to adopt the open internet order. An open internet has become an indispensable platform for free expression and economic growth. The key to the internet's success has been its open design, which allows innovation and ideas to come from anywhere or anyone. Nobody needs permission when it comes to access. My position on this issue has been consistent and transparent. In 2010, when the commission adopted its first open internet order, I made clear that I would have applied the fixed rules to mobile services and the evolution of the fixed and mobile broadband industry since then has only reaffirmed my commitment to this principle. We all know that many Americans, particularly low-income consumers, rely heavily on their mobile devices, and according to a recent study, for approximately 10% of all Americans, their mobile phone is their access to the Internet. Users of mobile devices should not be relegated to a second-class internet experience. They need and deserve a robust experience on par with their wired peers. This is why I cast my vote to approve the strongest open internet protections ever proposed by the FCC. For you, all of you, Going without a, that smartphone, tablet, or access to the internet for any length of time, including those I see accessing um, and looking at their equipment right now, I won't penalize you for that, even though I might think about that amendment in the Communications Act, but don't tell anybody. <laughs> but what too many of us wrong is a temporary inconvenience. 
I won't penalize you for that, even though I might think about that amendment in the Communications Act, but don't tell anybody. <laughs> but what too many of us wrongly assume is that this option is available to everyone. But millions of Americans lack access to the internet, particularly at home. They turn to libraries for access to broadband, but small branches all over this nation, they're closing. And the ones that are still open, they're only open when most of us are at work. And if you're lucky enough to get to a library, that terminal that you would like access to is too often taken. What is most troubling about this scenario is that these are the people who would benefit from connectivity the most. And for too many people, access is being denied. Now, the FCC has taken many step to, steps to narrow this gap, particularly in rural, hyper-urban, and suburban areas, and I remain proud of these efforts. But what I am particularly interested in is fully delivering on Congress's mandate for universal service. I strongly supported the creation of a fund dedicated to ensure that consumers in all regions of this nation have access to mobile broadband services reasonably comparable to what we have in urban areas. Mobility phase one, phase, mobility fund phase one and tribal mobility fund phase one have connected thousands of previously unserved communities and populations with mobile service. In June of 2014, the commission adopted a further notice that proposed to retarget the mobility fund phase two in light of marketplace developments. We also proposed to retain a dedicated mobility fund focused on preserving service that exists today due to support from the Universal Service Fund and existing service to areas unserved by 4G LTE. Recently, CCA called on the commission to restructure and implement phase two of the mobility fund, and I quote, in a manner that recognizes the unique benefits that mobile broadband services provide to consumers and reflects the full extent to which large portions of the country still lack access to that so such services, close quote. CCA also urged the commission to increase the funding available to mobile providers through the mobility fund to reflect the true state of mobile broadband deployment, which is far more limited than the commission assumes in the further notice of proposed rulemaking and the increasingly essential nature of mobile broadband services. What I am not pleased with at this time is the lack of movement on adopting a permanent mobility fund. The commission decided on a dedicated mobility fund nearly four years ago, but funding for competitive ETCs is frozen at 60% of the 2011 support level. Now is the time, my friends, for the commission to ensure that funding directly to mobile providers extracts the most value for each dollar of universal service funds spent and now is the time for consumers in those unserved areas to have what most of us take for granted. In order to achieve these objectives, I believe, the commission must advance the availability of mobile services in America and establish a dedicated mobility fund. Now, as most of you know, <laughs> as most of you know, one of my colleagues recently said that a technology-neutral phase two auction could address the concerns of small wireless carriers who have been counting on the mobility fund auction. If you do not agree, I encourage you to challenge that assertion and provide detailed data as to why you disagree. It is important for CCA to continue to educate policymakers on key issues like competition, spectrum, access to devices and networks, universal service reform, next-gen 911 solutions, and consumer protections, because it is not only necessary for you to thrive, it is necessary for all of our communities to thrive. So I want to thank you for pausing for a few moments and listening to this Methodist. 
and I wish for you a continued successful summit. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. And, I, and now, before you take me to the woodshed, Commissioner, I, I want you to know I, too, am Methodist. And I was speaking from experience only. So thank you. Thank you so very much. I really appreciate uh, your time and, and, and really appreciate your comments. Uh, we, uh, uh, again, uh, will work closely with you to help make some of this a reality. Um, I, why don't we uh, get going for the, uh, uh, for the next... Um, uh, session we have here. We have, uh, uh, let's see. Okay, we're going to be hearing.